In English, the name of our community is Walpole Island, W-A-L-P-O-L-E. It was named after a British explorer. But in our language, we call it Kajwanong, which means where the waters meet, because it's actually a number of islands that are at Delta at the mouth of the river. So I'm very happy to be here today to, to talk about uh, racism. And I want to begin with a story. In Michigan, the issue of segregated graveyards finally came to a head on August 10th, 1960, when an official at Troy's Whitechapel Cemetery halted the burial of George Vincent Nash, a 66-year-old Winnebago Indian, just after his coffin had been lowered into the ground next to his wife's grave. The official explained that burials at Whitechapel were restricted to members of the Caucasian race. Later, the president of the Cemetery Association argued that it didn't matter that Nash was an honorably discharged veteran of World War I and that his wife, who was Ojibwe, had been buried in 1949 without incident. If we make an exception in this case, he said, some 40,000 plot owners would be able to take action against the cemetery because they paid for the restriction. The American Legion buried Nash three days later at Perry Mount Park Cemetery in Pontiac after several other cemeteries refused to accept him. Meanwhile, lawmakers in Lansing took up the issue with Senator Basil W. Brown of Detroit and Highland Park ultimately sponsoring legislation prohibiting discrimination by race or color by private cemeteries. The bill passed into law in 1961 and its constitutionality was upheld in a 1966 state Supreme Court decision. Although largely overlooked today, gaining equality inside Michigan's graveyards was considered a significant early victory in the civil rights movement. Okay. So I'm sharing the story with you because it took place in Michigan where I'm from and because the person involved was Native American and not only was the person that they were talking about, George Vincent Nash, Native American, but he was my uncle. Yeah. So I don't know how it happened that he was able to buy two plots. You know, he was the same man when he bought the plots. And <laughs> my aunt was buried there and actually he was married to my dad's sister. And you know she was also Native American. She was buried there. And when when he died, you know they they celebrated the funeral mass and the procession went to the cemetery and they actually had the committal service. And then before my family left, that's when they told him that he couldn't be buried there because he was Indian. So I don't I don't know how that all happened, but it's uh, you know one of many things that have happened in, in my life story, in my family's life story. And so. I wanted to share that story with you because it can give you something to reflect upon and it is something that's very personal to me. I'm going to spend uh, probably a little bit less than a half hour trying to uh, share some of the wisdom that, that we have uh, assembled at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, Secretary of Culture and Diversity in the Church, long name for the office I worked in until yesterday. And we developed a program a few years ago called Building Intercultural Competency for, Minis for Ministers. And, and one of the modules of the, of the workshop is on racism, so I'm mainly going to share uh, some, of the, some of the things that we put together for that particular module. I have a lot of material here in this presentation, which I'm not going to get to, but uh, that doesn't matter. I'm going to take the time that I have because I think that what I can share with you can be uh, helpful, insightful, and you know, give you uh, a lot to think about. Okay, so first of all, we can ask the question, what are racism and prejudice? And how can we as ministers, as members of uh, various Catholic uh, communities and organizations recognize racism in our midst? Okay. So I want to just kind of outline some of the things that, that we want to try to look at as we're, as we're looking at the dynamics of prejudice, stereotyping, and discrimination. First of all, uh, one of the things that is helpful for us to look at is 
uh, how we relate to other people, depending on whether we consider them to be a part of a group that we belong to or not. In group, in out group, perceptions and behavior. Secondly, we want to look at the ways that we view people who we consider to be other. And then we want to look more uh, specifically at the dynamics of racism so that we can better understand the effect that it has on all of us. And here on my, uh, on my uh, <clears throat> slide here, it says to better understand its effect on its victims. And all of us are victims of racism, whether we're part of a dominant group or not. And so I think it's good for us to realize that all of us have been victimized by this wrongdoing, this injustice, this sin that exists in our midst. And then to look at how we can positively influence healthy dynamics of living together in our communities. Okay, so here are some uh, definitions, and there are many definitions for all of these terms, and there are some that you might find helpful that you've learned, uh, but this, this is a starting point for us, okay? So prejudice is a hostile or negative attitude toward a distinguishable group of people based slowly on their membership in that group. I don't know why my, my uh, slide went forward. So today we're, we're going to mostly talk about how that, that works when it comes to race, all right? But there are lots of different ways that that has, got, has been expressed over time. I have a, some friends visiting today from Michigan who've come to visit me and they're here present. And I'm mentioning them, it's uh, Jerry and Bobby Silveray, and they're very good friends of mine. And Jerry is Polish, his parents are both Polish. And when the Polish people came here, there was a lot of discrimination and prejudice. They were not accepted by lots of people. So in that case, it wasn't really a matter of race. You know, so there are lots of different ways that we can express prejudice. <clears throat> the stereotype is a generalization about a group of people in which Identical characteristics are assigned to virtually all members of the group, regardless of actual variation among the members. And so, you know, it's something that it's it's just something that we try to do when we try to understand people who are different than ourselves. And I've had the experience a lot of getting to know people who know that I'm American Indian, Native American, and then they'll say, "Well, now that I know you, you know, you don't fit those stereotypes." Or uh, you know, maybe a little bit more bluntly, they'll say, well, you know what, you don't really seem like an Indian to me, <laughs> because I don't fit the stereotypes. <laughs> okay, and then discrimination is an unjustified negative or harmful action towards a member of a group simply because of his or her membership in that group. Okay, so I think these are pretty straightforward definitions, and I don't know if if anybody has any disagreement about, about what's being presented right here. It's just giving us a starting point to continue our conversation, okay? So then, what causes prejudice? Prejudice results when we create groups in which some people are in and other people are out, okay? And this is something that it's easy for us to do as human beings, and we do it in lots of different ways in a lot of different contexts. When we look at the in-group, our bias is to have positive feelings about the members of the group, to offer special treatment that we reserve only for the people who are part of our in-group, okay? And you know, we do that in lots of ways, all right? But it has a particular application when we talk about, about race. And then when we look at out-group, uh, we usually look at people who we consider to be part of the out-groups as negative, we have negative perceptions and we make negative uh, <clears throat> judgments about, about those people. Okay, so when we, when we look at people who are other, people who are different, these are some of the things that we do. And it, it's all a matter of just trying to, to figure out, you know, what does the relationship that I have with them mean, or what does it not mean? Or, you know, how do, how do I try to make sense of the fact that, you know, I see these people before me that they're different than me. So, one of the things that we do is we generalize about them. We take the information that, that we have and, and we put it together and we just make blanket applications to everybody who's part of that group. And then another thing that we often do is that we demonize them, which means that we somehow perceive them as a threat. 
we somehow perceive them as inferior. We somehow perceive that, you know, I don't really like these people being around me, you know. And there are lots of other ways that we can describe how we demonize people who are other, people who are different than ourselves. Sometimes we see them as helpless children. And, you know, that dynamic played a lot in the relationship between uh, the United States government and the mainstream and Native Americans. You know, we were considered to not be fully human. Uh, we were, for example, not recognized as legal persons here until 1924. Okay, the government thought that they needed to take care of us and we couldn't take care of ourselves or we couldn't have a proper life unless the government was overseeing us. In Canada, Native people did not receive recognition as legal persons until 1960, so it wasn't that long ago. We tend to trivialize painful differences. Um, in matters of race, you know, there's typically a group that is dominant. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And it's easy when you're in a dominant group to not be aware of how racism, prejudice, discrimination affect other groups of people. And if there is evidence presented, you know, it's often easy to trivialize because it doesn't mean a lot. You know, it's not too relevant. So it's like, well, they can they can deal with that. I mean, what what's what's the big deal? What's going on? You know, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal or that important. And then the other thing that we do is that we can make them invisible. And this, this dynamic operates a lot in, in the northern part of the United States. I, I've lived most of my life in the north, and being here, living in Washington and northern Virginia, is very enlightening because the dynamics among different groups of people, especially the dynamics among races, and, and particularly blacks and whites, is very different than it is in the north. In the north, it is very easy to, to not interact with people who are not of your race, and so that's it's a very weak, easy way of making people invisible. So uh, there's a question here at the bottom that we can think about, and perhaps you can offer some comments when we have our panel discussion in a little while. Uh, to just think yourself individually, what can I do to eliminate prejudice? And some people just very naturally have a tendency to be to be very curious about other people. They want to learn about people. Uh, they're willing to to be exposed to differences, different languages, different culture, different food, different types of music, different ways of of dressing, and so on. And that helps a whole lot when it comes to to relating to people who are different than ourselves. And for for some others of us, we don't have that natural disposition to be curious and, and to want to learn about other people. But that is one thing that can really help a whole lot when it comes to uh, dealing with encountering prejudices within ourselves. So I just want to invite you to think about that now. And if you've got some comments to offer later, you can do it when we'll have a short question and answer period at the end of my presentation and also when uh, the rest of the panelists join me up here on the uh, stage in a little while. OK, so now we want to talk about race. And it has been my experience that throughout our country, people don't really want to talk about race. And in these workshops, we have opportunities for people to get together in small groups. And, and it's always the case that people find different reasons to, to not talk about race. Uh, we had one workshop in Washington a few years ago, and, and Corinne was there. And there were a number of uh, participants you know, who were of a, a particular race, and they said, you're not talking about this with us in the right way. You're not giving us the opportunity to talk about it the way that we want, although we, we have no directions at all in, in how the conversation should take place. But the excuse for not talking about it was that we didn't present it in the right way. And so uh, there are other, that's just one I'm not going to offer anymore. But in every, every workshop that we've held, uh, we've had pushback in different ways. Uh, there was one time at another workshop, which was actually held in Baltimore, where uh, the people were we're um, contesting a, a term that we use, which, which I'll um, bring up with you in a little bit, the term white privilege. So everybody got into you know, a, a hissy fit about the word, the, the term white privilege. And so we, we didn't really talk about anything because everybody got to say, I don't like that term, and you know, we really shouldn't be using it. <clears throat> the next day, I thought about it overnight, and, and I uh, 
said I wanted to share something with everybody. And, and the pushback on that terminology came after I had shared a lot of difficult things that have happened in my family's life history. Okay? And I said, I just wanted to invite us to think about the, the pushback on, on this particular term. Because, you know, using this term to describe something that actually exists, something that is real, is uncomfortable for you. But in comparison to the things that have been done to me and my family because of the existence of this dynamic called white privilege, I mean, it's really not much of anything in comparison. And it helped people to realize that, you know, that they were, they were, they were feeling uncomfortable with the term because it did describe something that was real and that they didn't quite want to uh, admit was real at the time. You know, so these, these kind of things happen all the time. So when we talk about racism, we first of all want to identify the racial anxiety that, ex that we have as a culturally learned behavior that can cripple intercultural leadership from casting its gaze on the elephant in the center of the living room of the intercultural and multicultural discussion. Okay, so I don't think that it's, it's inappropriate to, to call racism the elephant in the center of the living room. We're talking about it today, and, and the dynamics of racism are very much evident throughout our country. So, you know, one thing that we need to do is just to say, you know, this, this is real, and this is something that we need to look at, and particularly as Catholics, as Christians, you know, because the greatest commandment that we have is to love the Lord first and to love one another, and racism is something that prevents us from loving one another in the way that the Lord wants us to love each other. Secondly, uh, we want to briefly review how this cultural anxiety affects the intercultural leader's ability to speak about his or her reality. So we developed this material for, for people who are serving in parishes and dioceses and other Catholic organizations and who are dealing with intercultural realities and who have leadership roles. But all of us are living in a country and living in situations, living in a diocese, and living in our cities where there are lots of people from, from different countries and people who are from different races. And then thirdly, uh, we want to uh, suggest means of developing our capacities as intercultural leaders or intercultural interactors to assist others on the path to leadership within the cultural context of white privilege. I'm gonna to get to that term in a little bit. And we want to present a framework for intercultural engagement that includes white privilege as a useful concept within the dialogue, and also suggests the pertinence of other variables such as gender and social class, because this also came up. There was another workshop where uh, people wanted to talk about gender issues and social class issues, and, and they're relevant. But in this particular case today, and, and as we had done in the past workshops, we wanted to have a particular focus on race. And it is true that when we come to talking about issues of prejudice and stereotyping and discrimination, that it is often pushed to the margin because it's not something that people are comfortable to talk about. And then we want to look at how we can demonstrate the transformative effect of group learning that arises from expressing and sharing the reality of racism as a lived experience among diverse racial, ethnic, and cultural communities. Okay. So before I carry on, I just wanted to uh, say to you that, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm, I'm American Indian, Native American. I grew up on an Indian reservation. And you know, this whole issue of race has always been you know, at the forefront of, of, of my experience throughout my whole life. Living on a reservation is uh, wonderful, has lots of great positive things about it. But one of the things that happens uh, living on a reservation is that you know we interact with people outside of the reservation. In my case, we started going to school off of the reservation in grade four. So we were a minority, you know, a small group of people who were different going to the schools. And most of the people on the reservation work off of the reservation. So we have to interact with the people in the towns that, that are right nearby. You know, we, we do our shopping and going to doctors and every just kind of everyday normal things off of the reservation. And what I experienced 
growing up was that people didn't like me because I was an Indian, because I looked different, because I was darker, and you know, people in the schools, people in stores, people in you know medical facilities would, you know, say lots of things to us like, "We're animals, we're stupid, we're dirty," you know, "We don't want you here." Uh, when we went to a store, you know, people would follow us around. People would refuse to serve us. When I was a child, I remember going to a movie in a small town in Michigan, which is right next door to the reservation. And I, I remember we sat in the balcony in the movie theater. And then I was about five years old. And afterwards, we went to a restaurant. And we sat in the section in the back of the restaurant. They had a partition, you know, that divided the Indian section. Okay. And I, and I asked my cousin, I had an older cousin who took us to the movie, and I said, you know, like, why do we sit in the balcony? Why are we sitting here? And she said, because we're special. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's what, that's what she's fond of me. But, you know, people sometimes think that, you know, racism is a black-white issue and it's something in the far distant past. But it isn't, you know, and we know that. We look at the things happening in Ferguson and Baltimore and, and New York and other places. So, you know, it, it's been something that is my lived experience Okay, and I just want to say at this point that the thing that's helped me to, to overcome those negative experiences, the thing that's helped me to, to know that you know, I'm the same as everybody else is, uh, you know, the teachings that my parents gave to me, you know, they pass along the faith to me, my parents have really great faith. They also believe that you know, we're all created in God's image, that we all have an equal dignity and worth, and they said that to us all the time. They said that the fact that you're Indian doesn't mean that you have to be diminished or limited in any way, that you can do whatever you want to do. And they encourage us to do that. And so that's what I, you know, that's what I uh, <clears throat> pursue. You know, and I, and I have lots of uh, obstacles to overcome and, and lots of opposition, but I've done it. And, and it's because of my faith in the Lord, it's because I believe what the Lord tells us about ourselves and because I try to live it. I try to live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. I have faith, I have love, and I have hope. And, and it's really, it's made all the difference for me. I come from the same background as lots of other people who are, who are very much living, you know, the woundedness and, and the anger and the unwillingness to forgive and, and lots of other negative things. I'm, I'm just like them. But the difference is our Lord Jesus Christ. The difference is I have said yes to him to, to be his faithful disciple and to live according to his love and truth and goodness. And, and that's enabled me to, to be who I am today. So. I want to offer that testimony to you right now because we're talking a little bit about lived experience. And it's the same thing that he wants to do for us who are here right now individually and all together in all the different contexts in which we live and serve the Lord within the church. I have my friends who are going to let me know when my half hour is up, so I'm just going to keep going. These are some of the documents that have, that have been uh, <clears throat> created by, by the bishops in, in different ways. Bishop Boverdi may mention to, to uh, a quote from one of the documents this morning. I'm not going to spend time on this, but you can find uh, these documents online and, and they would be good things to read because the, the bishops in their role as the successors of the apostles, as our chief shepherds, have you know, sought the Lord in prayer and sought his truth and wisdom that is given to us through the revelation of scripture and the teaching authority of the church to to give us teaching that can guide us, teaching that comes from the Lord. And so you can look these up, you know, when you get the opportunity. And if anybody wants, at the conclusion of our, our time here right now, I'd be happy to give you these references. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to skip this. Okay. So, I didn't really give a definition of white privilege earlier, so I'm just going to give you a, a simple one right now. And if you have some objections to, to this term and what I'm saying, you know, think about it. And, and maybe, you know, look up on Google, look up on the computer later, you know, various ways that the term, and how the term white privilege is, is presented. And what it's talking about is that in the Americas, that there are a group of people who have been dominant, who have had power, who are from Europe, and to whom, you know, the, the label white is often applied when it comes to talking about race. And this, this whole notion of race is actually a, a, a construct that isn't legitimate. You know, that, I mean, in reality, if, if you look at biology, if you look at anthropology, I mean, if you look at 
at us in any scientific way. You know, race is not something that is actually legitimate. You know, it's actually all about just the color of our skin. But as human beings, you know, it's a construct that, that we have used to, to apply many attributes to different groups of people because of the color of their skin. And when we talk about white privilege, what we're talking about is that the people who have had power, the people who, who have had dominance, are of European descent that they are white, and that they're the ones that put together the laws and the social customs, the institutions in our country, and that in doing so, because as human beings we have a tendency to think about you know, how things operate for us and how we would like them to operate, that they're done with, with a focus on, on the one particular group of people. And, and to say it not so benignly, sometimes the laws and the institutions have been put together in a way to exclude people who are different, people who are other, and, and particularly when, when it comes to race. Okay, so that's uh, what I'm talking about when I use the word white privilege. And so I invite you to think about it. You can ask us some questions about it later. You could ask me in particular if you'd like. But uh, one of the challenges that we face in the country, which becomes more and more culturally diverse over time, is to, to not deny that those of us who are framing the question about race are also influenced by the unperceived racism around us. Okay. Racism is not something comfortable to look at and to acknowledge. So without even being very intentional about it, it's easy for us to just put it on the shelf. You know, if, if we're not forced to deal with it, we don't, okay? And, and I think it's good for us to realize that you know, we have to look at it. it. It's real and it's here and it, it impacts all of us. It doesn't just impact those who are in, you know, in a, in a power, in a, in a position that is less powerful. It affects all of us. And we effectively deny the challenge to confront racism by imposing a down talk rule because we don't want to talk about it. So, you know, we, we just run away from the topic if it comes up. I mentioned earlier about these workshops that we had in the past and, you know, every group found a way to try to run away from, from the conversation, you know, and it's uncomfortable. And we don't want to think that we're like that, you know, but we have to, we have to acknowledge it. So we have all these different dynamics and, and all these different conventions in place to, to not talk about racism, to deny any feelings that we have about this particular topic, and also not to trust ourselves. Because we don't really spend any time thinking about it or contemplating what does it mean for me, what does it mean for my community, what does it mean for our society, what does it mean for our country, then we can tend to think, well, I don't really know what this is all about. So I don't think that I can make good judgments about it, so I would just rather not. But we need to find our voice, okay? We need to uh, break the don't talk rule, and we need to uh, learn about one another. We need to learn about how does racism actually operate within our country, you know, what, what are these things that are happening all about? You know, these incidents in Ferguson, um, you know, the fact that there are so many young black men who, who have been shot in the last year that are now uh, being reported on regularly. It's not that, I, I don't know, I mean, I can't say because I haven't looked at the statistics, it, it may not be the case that it's happening more, but people are more aware of it. And so what is it all about? You know, and, and there are other groups that experience discrimination, and there are other groups that are marginalized, and there are other groups that are not treated properly because of the color of their skin. So, so to acknowledge that and to say, well, what does it mean for me, for my community, for our country, and, and what can I do to help? And so we have to find our voice. And in order to find our voice, we need to acknowledge the reality, and we need to do what we can to learn about it, to, to learn more about these things that have taken place over the past year, just as a starting point, perhaps, and say, well, what was, what was that all about? You know, these this, um, things that happened in Ferguson and the rioting that happened afterwards, and, and the man who was killed in Baltimore, and the response 
after that incident took place. The response was very strong because the wounds are very strong and they're very deep. And that's true for, for, my, for me, for my family. Uh, right now, somebody asked me if I could talk about Blessed Junipero Serra, who's going to be canonized on September 23rd at the Basilica here in Washington. And there are different Native Americans who object to the canonization of this missionary because the wounds that we have experienced by the dominant society, the wounds and the injustice that we experienced by the church are long lasting and they're very deep and, and we haven't healed from them, okay? So, you know, the same kind of thing takes place, you know, in, in these other incidents that we're so much aware of in the last year. You know, it's, it's a response on the part of people who, who have been wronged. A lot of injustice has taken place and they've been wounded and they're hurting and the wounds and the hurts are very deep and, and they're very they're very large. Okay, so I've been I've just been indicated uh, by my friends that, that my time is at an end. So I want I want to uh, stop at this point because I want to give you a few minutes to ask me any questions before uh, we assemble for a panel uh, discussion up here in the front. So there is a lot more that I could say. I think that what I presented is enough for for all of you to have a lot to think about right now, and I want to invite some questions. Okay, yes, and can you just say your name and where you're from, just so people know? Dave uh, Borowski, I'm with the Catholic uh, Herald. Yes. Uh, I just, you mentioned that when you were a child, mm -hmm. uh, that when you went out to a theater, you were up in the, without, you yeah. were forced to be up in the balcony of the theater. When, when, when you went yeah. to a restaurant, you were segregated mm -hmm. in the theater. Uh, in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. How long ago, you don't appear to be very old. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I, I can uh, make. I'll make a disclaimer at this point. Yeah. Yes. The question is, uh, you know, I, he said you mentioned in your presentation that when you were a child that you sat in the balcony in the movie theater because that's where they had the, the American Indians sit, and you went to a restaurant and sat in in the section in the back because that was for the Indians. And he said, you, "How long ago was that? You don't look like that old." <laughs> so I will offer a disclaimer right now. Uh, I'm actually going to turn 60 on October the 14th. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I attribute it to, to uh, good holy living. <laughs> no, uh, that, 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 the last statement isn't true. I, I do strive to you know, be faithful, follow the Lord. But uh, it was in the early 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, way in the back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, huh? Yep. Hi, thank you for speaking, Father. Yes. My name is Abby Doherty, and I recently completed a year of service in Camden, New Jersey, mm -hmm. with the Alberts and Francis Sales, by the grace of God. And I'm, I'm so excited and I'm so grateful that you spoke about white privilege, because I think it is such a taboo topic, mm -hmm. especially in Catholic and Christian communities, to confront that um, alongside our, you know, black or Hispanic or Yes. And so I just, um, I wanted to ask if you think that the, sort of the root cause to our resistance to talk about white privilege is really our fear of entering into deeper community and deeper relationship with people of another race. Because I think that um, growing up, I actually grew up in this area, and it upsets me to say that I wasn't with, and I didn't grow up with many students of color, and I wish mm -hmm. that I had. Yes, it's very insightful that, you know, uh, there is resistance to, to wanting to acknowledge that there is such a thing as white privilege and that it is an obstacle to, to being able to, to relate to people who are different than us in, in the way that the Lord wants us to and therefore as members of, of the church, it, it's something that, that we really need to be able to, to uh, acknowledge, to acknowledge the reality 
to think about it and to find our own voice, which means that we think about, well, how can I talk about this? How can I contribute? How can I help all of us to be better in, in our interactions with one another? And there, there are lots of other reasons why there is resistance to, to the notion. You know, we don't want to think that, that we have you know, these kind of faults. Uh, and I think another, another thing about it all is that you know, the, um, <clears throat> the dominant group has been in power for a long time and been able to determine you know, the interactions among the different groups. They've made the laws. They are in charge of the institutions. They make the rules. And so in order to begin to talk about our reality, which is not the same one in which all of those things are developed, can be perceived as threatening. Yeah, so that's just how things are as human beings. Yes. The rear if you just end up sort of. Okay. Yeah, if you can help me. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I'm, my name is Stephen Bratland. I'm from an organization called uh, Million Dollar Boycott, which is all about uh, divesting from uh, the privatized prison industry and also mm -hmm. investing in education. Uh, but my, my question was also about uh, white privilege. Yes. I grew up in southern New Mexico, which is a, a, a very um, kind of economically depressed area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, you could talk to them about the fact that when we're talking about white privilege, we're really talking about you know the ability of, of the dominant group, the dominant society, to, to make the rules, to 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 put the laws in place, to be at the top of leadership in in government, in commerce, in education, in all the different institutions. And it, it doesn't mean that because you're part of this dominant group that, that you're going to be rich or that you know, you're going to have advantages just because you're white, even if you live in an economically depressed area. I mean, that, you know, the, the two are not really related to one another, you know, the circumstances that you live in and you know, the fact that there is this dynamic that has been at work in our country from the very beginning called, called white privilege. So, if you could help them to understand that it's about you know the dominant group being able to have power to influence things and and especially for for people who are not part of the group, we have been subject to you know a lot of negative consequences, laws that don't respect our proper dignity and freedom, laws that don't enable us to pursue the American dream. I think that would be a good way to put it. Laws that you know deny us. Um, access to, to good education, to employment opportunities, you know, and, and not even just the laws make those things difficult, you know, it's just discrimination, prejudice, treating us as other, keeping us out, viewing us as a threat. Okay? Yes? Million dollars, million to that sit in those white parishes and choose. 
but where can the that we as as capital, whether we're black, white, that in those parishes say that we have allowed all of the black uh, parishes where children go in those inner cities can no longer go because they cannot afford to put their children in the Catholic schools to get an education to do. And we want to come here now and do, we can do something. And I implore that, the, that we do something to save those parishes and talk about that too. So as we talk about racism, we talk about it because to get out of it is about education as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I, you know, have not had a lot of experience with, you know, with the situation you're talking about, you know, the inner city experience other than from a Hispanic context, nor with, you know, with, with the issues with schools. But um, Deacon Turner is here from Washington, and uh, perhaps when we have our panel, he, he could address that more directly. I think it's very powerful, you know, the fact that you're sharing with us about this in, in your own uh, view and perception and experience of it, and, and it's one that is very common and one that is very, very commonplace throughout the country. So I'm not, I don't feel real, you know, knowledgeable about, about you know, everything that takes place in, in this particular context and dynamic. So I would like to defer to someone else who, who could address it. And um, I don't know if Deacon Turner can do that in a little bit. Or if you define it, okay. Yeah, he'd be willing to do that. Great. We've gone a little over.